Chapter 3 Salty Trip with Pepper First thing back in Milwaukee, I reported to my parole officer, a Mr. Rand, I think. After asking a thousand questions and filling out a mountain of papers, he gave me an IQ test. When he computed my score, his sea-blue eyes saucered in surprise. He couldn't understand how a boy with a score of 175 could do a stupid thing like peddling a girl's ass on the sidewalk. If that IQ test had been on the basis of the half-baked criminal, pimping theories that I had picked up in the joint at the table from those chili pimps that were churning in my mind, and that I was so eager to try, my score would have been zero. I was 18 now, six feet two inches tall, slender, sweet, and stupid. My maroon eyes were deeply set, dreamy. My shoulders were broad, and my waist as narrow as a girl's. I was going to be a heartbreaker, all right. All I needed was the threads and a whore. Mama's small, lucrative beauty shop was on the main drag. Poor Mama. She was doomed, I guess, to inadvertently set up my disasters. I had started on my job delivering for the drugstore owned by the friend of Mama's who had hired me to satisfy the parole condition of a job upon release. As fate would have it, Mama's shop and the drugstore were in the same building. Mama and I lived in an apartment over the storefronts. Mama called me in from the sidewalk one day about three months after I had gotten parole. She wanted me to meet one of her customers who was getting her eyebrows arched. I walked through the pungent odors rising from the hot pressing combs pulling through the kinky hair of several customers to the rear of the shop. There she was, flashy as a Christmas tree sitting before a mirror at a dressing table with her back to me. Mama stopped plucking at her brows as she introduced us. Mrs. Ibbets, this is my son, Bobby. Like a yellow cat hypnotizing a bird, she sat there motionless, her green eyes smoky, as she stared at me through the mirror. Oh, Bobby, I have heard so much about you. It's so exciting to meet you. But please, call me Pepper. Everyone does. I don't know what excited me more as I stood there, her raw sensuality or the blazing rocks on her tapered fingers that I was sure hadn't come from Crestjee's. I mumbled something like I had to go back to the drugstore to work and I would see her around. Later I saw her slide into her sleek caddy convertible, her white silk dress riding up exposing the satin sheen of her banana yellow thighs. As she gunned away from the curb, she turned deliberately and gave me a full dose of those hot green eyes. She was signing our deal. I quizzed around and got the background on her. She was 25, an ex-whore who had worked the jazziest houses on the eastern seaboard. A wealthy white fence and gambler had tricked with her out there, and it had gotten so good to him that he crossed her pimp into a five-year bit and squared her up. Three days later, a half hour before closing, an order came in for a case of mums. The address was in the plush heights, miles from the store. I made the trip on a bicycle. She answered the door wearing only a pair of white lace step-ins. My erection was hard and instant. It was a fabulous pad, and the lights were soft and blue. The old man wouldn't be back for a week. I was just a hep punk. I wasn't in her league, but one of my greatest assets has always been my open mind. That freak bitch cajoled and persuaded me to do everything in the sexual book and a number of things not even listed. What a thrill for a dog like her to turn out a tender fool like me. She was a hell of a teacher, all right, and what a performer. If Pepper had lived in the old biblical city of Sodom, the citizens would have stoned her to death. She nibbled and sucked hundreds of tingling bruises on every square inch of my body. Fair exchange, as the old saw goes, is never robbery. It took me a week to get the stench of her piss out of my hair. She sure had been pimped hard back east. She hated men, and she was taking her revenge on me. She had taught me to snort girl. 
and almost always when I came to her pad, there would be thin sparkling rows of crystal cocaine on the glass top of the cocktail table. We would snort it through alabaster horns, and then in the mirrored bedroom we made circus love until our nerve ends shrieked. Pepper and that pure cocaine would have made a freak out of a priest. She had sure put me on a fast track. I couldn't know at the time that at the end of the line stood the grim state penitentiary. I was green, all right, and twice as soft, and Pepper knew it. Here was a hardened ex-whore who knew all the crosses, all the answers, who handled lots of scratch and wasn't laying a red penny on me. The dazzling edge on our orgies was dulling for me. But I was flipping Pepper with the techniques she taught me. I knew all the buttons to push for her, and she burned hotter than ever for her little puppy. No wonder I was freaking for free. Those eastern pimps had charged her a fortune. I tried one night to get a C-note from her for a suit. I knew I had really come on fine in the bed. She had almost climbed the walls in passion. Sugar, I said. I saw a wild vine for a bill downtown. If you laid the scratch on me, I could cop tomorrow. She slitted her green eyes and laughed in my face and said, Now listen, little puppy. I don't give men money. I take it from them. And besides, as sweet as you are to this pussy, you don't need a suit. I like you as you are, with no clothes on at all. I was a rank greenhorn for sure, but her cold turn down of my plea for a C-note was bitchy cute. And I was a salty sucker so I reacted like any stupid would-be pimp who had been georged. I had filed up basic business. I had led with my dick instead of my mitt. I reached down and slapped her hard against the side of her face. It sounded like a pistol shot. On impact, a thrill shot through me. I should have slugged her with a baseball bat. The bitch uncoiled from that bed like a striking yellow cobra, hooked her arms around my waist, and sank her razor-sharp teeth into my navel. The shock paralyzed me. I fell on my back across the bed, moaning in pain. I could feel blood rolling from the wound down toward my crotch, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. Pepper was sure a strange, twisted broad. She was breathing hard now, but not in rage. The violence, the blood, had turned her on. She was gently caressing me as she licked with a feathery tongue, the oozing wound on my belly. She had never been so tenderly efficient, and she took me on a beautiful trip around the universe. The funny thing was, that throbbing awful pain somehow became a part of, melted into the joy of the feathery tongue, the thrill of the thing that Pepper was doing to me. I guess Freud was right. If it thrills you to give pain you can get your jollies taking it. When I left Pepper, I was sapped. I felt like an old man. My mood was as bleak and cheerless as the gray dawn I cycled through. When I got home and looked into the mirror, a death's head stared back at me. The vampire bitch was sucking my life's blood all right. I also knew that crystal cocaine wasn't exactly a health tonic. Pepper was too fast, too slick for me. I had to make her shit or get off the pot. I made the skeleton in the mirror a solemn vow that before the week was out, I would in some way get Weeping Shorty, a pimp about 55 who, while a gorilla pimp, was the best pimp in town, to pull my coat, to give me a plan for putting a ring in Pepper's nose. Before I got busted, I had seen him at Jimmy's joint. He had looked horrible then, and now less than a year and a half later, he looked like a breathing corpse. Hoss was his boss. He had chippied around and gotten hooked. It was Friday, almost midnight, when I found him. He looked at me and made that clacking sound against the roof of his mouth with his tongue. You know, that mischievous, weirdly joyful sound that a young kid makes the instant before he rams a hat pin into your eardrum. Then he said, 
will kiss my dead mammy's ass if it ain't Mac and Youngblood, the whore's pet and the pimp's fret. The junkie bastard was jeffing on me, lashing me with contempt and scorn. Old pimps always know when a youngster with a yen for the pimp game is desperate for advice. After all, they remember when they started and what a bitch it was just to learn the million questions. The answers would come slowly, from heartbreaking trial and error, from the ass-kissing of the few who had solved the riddle, who pimped by the book. The cleverest pimp could give a thousand years and never come close to the answers. Weeping Shorty was an old man, and he had gotten past the questions and had worked out a few answers, but even so, he knew a thousand times more than I did. So, I fought for control. I couldn't show anger. If I did, he would cut me loose. We had been standing under the awning of a vacant storefront. He pulled me with the jerk of his head. I followed him to a big shabby Buick. It was parked at an intersection in a cheap trick district. When we got inside the Buick, I understood why he had parked it there. He could watch and keep tabs on his stable of scrawny junkie whores working the four corners of the intersection. He sat under the wheel, not saying anything, his eyes straight ahead. I had kissed his ass for a half hour, and now he was freezing up. I thought of the tiny pile of cocaine wrapped in tin foil under my instep that I had filched from Pepper. I fished it out and held it in my hand. Perhaps the cocaine would open him up. I turned to him and said, Weeping, do you want a light snort of girl? He stiffened like a butcher knife had been run into his back. He looked at the wad of tinfoil in my palm and snatched it in the same motion, hurled it through the window on his side. His top was blown. He shouted, Nigga, ain't you got no sense? You trying to go back to the joint and blow my wheels? I said, What did I do wrong? All I did was to offer you the C just to be sociable. What's wrong with that? He said, Sucker, First, booty butt, you don't transport no hard in your stomp. Keep it in your mitt so you can down it fast to the turf. Second, you're on parole. You're hot. You ain't got no business sitting dirty in my short. There's a law, sucker, that can confiscate a short with stuff in it. You know if the heat had hit on you, you would unload in my short. Keep stuff off you. When you stop somewhere, down it in the street until you're ready to split. It's better to get beat for the stash than beat for the heat. Now what took your head out of Pepper's ass long enough for you to look me up? Oh, how this junkie creep bugged me.